May I ask you, if you would please, to turn with me to the section or the portion our brother read to us. Pardon? It was dropping off. Okay? Okay. In Second Kings chapter 23, <clears throat> Josiah's thorough biblical reformation. Let me, let, me, let me just take a few minutes to introduce this particular section to you. After the discovery of the Bible in the temple, Hilkiah the high priest, or by Hilkiah the high priest, He gave it to the Secretary of State, Shephan, to take it to the king to read. The monarch was deeply moved, as we have seen, and he sent his court official to Huda the prophetess to find God's mind. The message brought back to the king literally shocked him. Josiah made a public proclamation to all the citizens of Judah to publicly gather in the house of the Lord, and there he made a covenant to obey the word of the book. The sacred historian who wrote Chronicles simply give us a summary of that in 33 of chapter 34. But the historian who wrote the book of Kings gave us a fuller account. The two then, or the two accounts are complementary, comprehensive, and we will look at Second Kings chapter 23, and then we will take two things from it. We'll take one, the exposition of the passage, and two, the application of it. So then, with that in mind, let us look at the exposition of the passage. Second Kings chapter 23. In the exposition, what we are going to do, we are going to see uh, two aspects of that radical reformation. You remember the proverb that says, Charity starts at home. So that is true of Josiah. He started at home. And two, then he extended the Reformation abroad in second part of the chapter. So let us take the first then. Josiah started at home. In this section, what I'm going to do, and I trust you'll be able to follow me closely, we are going to see exactly what Josiah did, and perhaps this might clarify your thinking when we entitled it, A Thorough Biblical Reformation. Let us see. I am not going to give you points one, two, three, four, five. I will introduce each paragraph, if you like, with the word Josiah, Josiah, Josiah. So rather than burdening you with a um, number of subdivisions. Let us then take the first. Josiah ordered the high priest and all under his charge to clean the temple from stem to stern. Look at how the sacred historian puts this for us in chapter 23 of Second Kings and verse 4. Look at what he tells us, and that is crucial. And the king commanded Hilkiah the high priest, the priests of the second order, and the doorkeepers to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the articles that were made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the hosts of heaven. And he 
burn them outside of Jerusalem in the field of Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. Now, that is crucial for understanding of what Josiah is going to do. And this is why I entitled it his thorough biblical reformation. His thorough biblical reformation. But that reformation must begin in the house of God. That's the important thing. And sometimes we miss this. Josiah started with the house of God. Now, very interestingly, God's people, we pray for the conversion of people, we pray for revival, and so on and so forth. All this is right. But do we pray that awakening the presence, the power, the authority of God would begin with us, among us, in our churches? See the difference? Charity begins at home. And here then, Josiah took on and got rid of all these wretched elements clogging the house of God. Okay, then let us take, let us continue. Josiah went further. He pulled down. He destroyed completely sinful practices and sinful symbols in the house of God. They turned the temple into a kind of what we would call probably today a junkyard. And the king knew if God is to be present in his palace, that is the temple, the temple must be cleansed from top to bottom. And look at what he did. Look at the language of the sacred historian in verse 6. He tells us this. And he, Josiah, brought out, look at what was in the house of God, wooden images from the house of God. And see what he did. To the brook of Kidron outside Jerusalem and burnt it at brook Kidron and the ground, the ashes and threw it or threw its ashes on the graves of the common people. But the important thing we are going to deal with is this. He went to the house. He dismantled. He broke down. He smashed. And then the sacred historian wants us to understand this carefully. So he emphasized the truth. You look at it in verse 7. Then he tore down the ritual booth of perverted persons. You know what a perverted person? They are the persons that our government are saying they can marry. Did you get that? Look at, let us read verse 7 again. Then he tore down the ritual booths of the perverted persons that were in the house of the Lord, where the women were hanging for the wooden image. You can imagine this. Sodom in the temple. That's frightening, isn't it? And the women who are supposedly to be more sensitive to that. Working to adorn those images while those guys were carrying on. Is there a most disgusting thing in the temple? But I'm not going to go further than that. 
Let us see again. Josiah then moved on. He expelled the mongrel priests from their awful practices and deprived them from the royal patronage given to them by former kings. May I give you that again? Because the work is radical. Josiah expelled the Mongol priests from their awful practices and deprived them from the royal patronage given to them by former kings. The young, remember, he's a young king. And he's taking steps to eradicate all the evils accumulated for 57 years. His father and his grandfather who opened the door of the temple or the doors of the temple for all these wretched practices. Look at verse 5. Look at what we are told in verse 5. Then he removed the idolatrous priests. Think of that. Where were the sons of Levi? He removed the idolatrous priests whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense on the high places in the cities of Judah and in the places all around Jerusalem and those who burned incense to Baal, to the sun, to the moon, to the constellations, and to the host of heaven. Judah was worse than a heathen country. Think of that. That is the people God called to be in covenant with himself. But there were more idols, more horrible things taking place there than among their surrounding nations. You see, the degradation, the insult to God. So this is why we need to examine all our practices. Are we doing in our churches what the scriptures command us to do? Or have we imported all the pagan notion into the church of Jesus Christ and put a layer of scripture over it so therefore our hypocrisies are not manifested? That's pretty serious. Let us move on. Josiah centralized the worship of God according to the word of God and ordered the priests to return to Jerusalem, God's chosen place of worship. The priests had given up because false worship went in. And to ensure that his orders were complied with, he defiled the sacred spots. And the old gentleman was so ashamed, they could not withstand Josiah, they were ashamed. You know what they did? They retired rather than obeying the king. They wanted no reformation, no change. They were used to that kind of worship in the house of God. You remember when it was built, the glory of the Lord filled the place. Remember, David spent the whole of his life and every single thing required for building that palace for the Lord that Solomon built was there. 
And the glory of God filled it. God had one tribe responsible to maintain, if you like, ecclesiastical law and order. The machinery of the temple, the police of the temple, to offer the sacrifices of the temple, to pray to God, the job of the high priest on the day of atonement. All this gone. Think of it. Back in UK, the one of the leading church buildings is now a homosexual palace. And they laugh at Christianity. <laughs> Here is your Christianity. We are in charge now. But I'll say this. When or if our nations, I'm speaking plural, if our nations have decided to go down the Sodom road, are they prepared to pay the price of Gomorrah? And for Christian people, there is worse ahead. Laws will be enacted. What do you do? The challenge will come when either we stand by the law of God or stand by the law of Caesar and then the conflict. And many of us may go to prison, lampooned, because we are determined to stand by the Bible. But there are many will be like Lot in Sodom. Brethren, these are serious and challenging days for us. Look at verses 8 and 9. Look at how this is put for us. Look at what it is. And he, Josiah, brought all the priests from the cities of Judah And defile the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba. And he broke down the high places at the gates which were at the entrance of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on the left of the city gate. Nevertheless, the priests of the high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord at Jerusalem, but they ate unleavened bread among their brethren. You can see what's happening. This reformation was so thorough that these old boys, these old priests, rather than reforming themselves, they decided to retire. Did they retire with their idols to their homes and go there to practice their things? The text doesn't say to us, so I cannot say. But they got their meal on retirement. What do you say about that? Brethren, this serious business we are facing in our nation. And in my nation, that, will, that may come in collision between Parliament and the throne. And many Christians have already brought to court. And you know who is standing to deform, to defend decency? The Muslims. And there are many people who are saying, ah, that's it.
when we depart from God and when we depart from his word, we must expect the worst. So as biblicists, as evangelical Christians, as biblical Christians, we must pray for wisdom, for skill, for understanding. We mustn't do anything rash, but weigh the matter carefully. There is no political agitation. We are not called to do so. We are called to preach the word of God. To apply it thoroughly. But Josiah had to deal with that. Let us proceed. Josiah turned the spot where pagan worship was practiced into a rubbish tip. Never again to see these abominable practices in Jerusalem, which was considered to be the holy city. You can remember what Jesus did on the few days before his crucifixion as he ascended the Mount of Olives and he was looking over Jerusalem. He burst into tears and he cried, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you do not know what is coming. Vespasian, Titus, the dismantling of the temple. And Jews expelled. Until after the war, they were given a homeland. Your house is left to you desolate. If we do not take our Bible seriously, believe it sincerely, preach it enthusiastically, we may be sowing seeds. That may germinate. Let us look. Look at chapter 23. Look at verse 10. Look at the language of verse 10. And he defiled Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter pass through the fire of Molech. You realize what is happening? Babies were being offered in sacrifice to the gods. Which is worse? A mother carrying her baby for nine months and all the pain and all the trouble that she must go through and then as a sacrifice to demon, the child must be offered as a sacrifice, an abomination that ought not to take place. Can you imagine this? When we depart from the Bible to fill our churches back, we bring all kind of tophets, all kind of gimmicks. Oh, people can dance, they can laugh, they can scream, but they all are on their way to hell. Now, I love Calypso. You know what is Calypso? All right. I love Calypso as a West Indian. Not all of it, but some of it. And as a boy, there was one particular piece that I loved. It was called Ten to One. The language, the poetry. It was so vivid. But about 1963, in the middle of it, or the end of it, when God brought me to myself, to himself, I realized, for the first time, I was singing that which was contrary to God's word. It was titled, entitled, called, Ten to One is Murder. 
The language, the music, it stirs you up. But you haven't got time to think of the language so much because it's so fast. The rhythm, the, the, the mind is going, is going, is going. But then, when God gives you a new mind, you begin to understand and you back off. Brethren, it is very, very serious what was happening in the temple. Furthermore, Josiah demolished the Mount of Corruption. You know what the Mount of Corruption was? When Solomon departed from the truth, he built these mounts, these worship places for all his wives. That for, four, for 500 years, Solomon's Mount of Corruption stood and not a king in Judah had the guts to break them down. They backed off. Josiah said, no. Solomon or no Solomon. Look at what he did. Look at verses 13 and 14. Look at the language. Then the king defiled the high places that were east of Jerusalem, which were on the south of the Mount of corruption, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had built for Asherah, the abomination of the Zidonians, for Chemosh, the abomination of the Mohabites, for Milcom, the abomination of the people of Ammon. He broke in pieces the sacred pillars, and he cut down the wooden images and filled their places with the bones of men. You see how far a young king, he took his responsibility seriously. For those of you who want to be preachers, if you do not take the Bible seriously, and if you do not believe the Bible with all your heart, you will be instruments for the destruction of the church of Christ because the devil will use you and it. And people who are clamoring for this and that, then the whole, before you do catch up, our nations will become returned to its paganism, to its heathenism. We have to take that seriously. Furthermore, look at that, we're going to just proceed again. Josiah pulled down the royal chapel. Think of that. The royal chapel. King Ahaz and Manasseh had erected in Judah as abominable superstition and awful. Let me give you that again. Josiah pulled down the royal chapel King Asa and Manasseh erected in Judah as, why? As abominable, superstitious, and awful. The man is determined to honor God. His reformation is absolutely radical, as the reformers did. Now, I'm not saying these were some of the things that inspired the reformers. No, they wanted the word of God to be central. And look at what Josiah did. Look at the language in verses 11 and 12. Look at what we are told. Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer that was in the court, and burned the chariot of the sun with fire. The altars that were on the roof of the upper chamber of Ahaz which the kings of Judah had made, and the altars which Manasseh had made in the two courts of the house of the Lord, the king broke down. And having turned them into powder, he threw them away. Then you ask, but Manasseh made a profession. Manasseh returned. Which of is, why were these practices he has practices. But here it is. 
And here is a king. He has read the word of God. That's all he had. He wasn't schooled in it. He didn't go to theological colleges. He didn't go to an academy. He didn't go to an institution. The word of God he read. And sometimes these liberal colleges do more harm to young men than anywhere else. So we've got to ask yourself a question. Do we send them to them or do we train our own? Well, there they'll get Greek. Many of us speak Greek. Can we not teach them Greek? Many of you speak Hebrew. Can you not teach them Hebrew? Can they not read? Give them work to and supervise. Train the men until in God's mercy, if there is a place, an institution, you can send them for training. By all means. But do not expose your young men to these idolatrous practices. They will return as liberals and they will destroy the church. We need to take that seriously. Very seriously. Especially when young men aspire for the work of the ministry. You say to me, well, old boy, you have served your tail. You went to college, you went to university, you did your thing, you fine. But perhaps, I'm saying perhaps, during my day, there were quite a lot of God's common grace and quite a lot of good places too where you had good men who feared God. But now, one has to rethink. And young men, if you, have a, if you feel that God is calling you to be a preacher, you go and discuss it with your elders, with your pastors. It's hard work. But who knows what God may do? There it was. All these abominable practices. So Josiah's reformation in Judah. We haven't even looked at it in Israel yet. Josiah's reformation in Judah was thorough and biblical. And the sacred historian caught this. And the sacred historian gathered all what Josiah had done. And look at what he tells us in verse 24. Look at what he's told us. Moreover, Josiah put away those who consulted mediums and spiritists, the household gods and idols, all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem that he might perform the words of the law which were written in the book that Hilkiah the priest found in the house of the Lord. Here the sacred historian is saying to us, don't think that Josiah was a killjoy. Don't think jo Josiah was a dictator. Josiah was obedient to scripture. That's what he's saying. And because of his obedience to Scripture, he did what he had to do and bring and brought about this thorough biblical reformation. If charity starts at home, gentlemen, we got to look into our churches and see what are the seeds of error that is being sown, the seeds of liberalism that is being sown, the seeds of anti-biblicism that is being sown, how we worship God. Turn to your Bible. Teach your people what the Bible says. If we don't do that, we leave our people vulnerable and our young men vulnerable. And if they do not sit on thorough biblical exposition, so therefore they can see what is being said, they can observe what is being said, they can exegete the text. Our job is to study carefully, study hard, and come with to the come to the people of God with the word of God. When we have done our work, 
It's not a question gavalanting and turn up in church and pull wool over the eyes of the people. That won't do. We've got to go back to the book. We've got to study the languages. We've got to read theology. We've got to spend time wrestling with God. Without which, whatever glorious things we do, it's all smoke. It's all smoke. And more smoke. And we bore the people stiff. And no wonder some of them are living and going to jumpy churches. No, brethren. For us, our forefathers died that we might have the Bible. When Luther was brought before the Diet of Worms, he had all his books spread before him. But he said, my conscience is a prisoner to the Word of God. He could not recant. So help me God. And why were they burnt alive? By bloody Mary. Not because they were bad folks. Because they were good folks. They were Bible folks. And it may be the time will come. People may not burn us alive, but they'll imprison us. They'll fine us. Heavy fines. But are we willing to stick by the word? Preach the word? Not railing at people. Don't get me wrong. But exegeting scripture. And people will call us odd. Our congregations, us. Well, all they do is read the Bible, preach it and pray, and sing old-fashioned hymns. Say, yeah, God loves that kind of thing. Then the sacred historian tells us, Josiah was uniquely thorough in the works of his hand. And in his heart. Look at how he sums that up for us in verse 25. Look at his language. Now before him, that is Josiah, there was no king like him. How? Who turned to the Lord with all his heart. Look at the language. With all his heart. With all his soul and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. No after him did any arise like him. Josiah, he placed all his intellect, all his energy, all his money, all his gifts, all his ability. All his strength, he poured it into the cauldron of divine truth. Like Paul, he could say, "My, I am going to Jerusalem and I am willing to Die for the Lord Jesus there. My life is not precious to myself. Could it be, gentlemen, some of us are safeguarding our own pension, our own retirement, our own name, our own culture, our own ability, and the glory of Christ is being undermined, tunneled, and tucked away. Could it be that? I'm not saying it is. Could it be that? And then our preaching is lethargic. There is no life, no energy, no vigor. And young people sit down there absolutely bored stiff. Because we are afraid of our emotions. Just in case people say we are crazy. Well, probably God need a few crazy preachers. And that would bring life to our churches. You see, my brethren, 
this thorough biblical reformation is the answer. But let me put a word of caution. You may be in a congregation where so many things are being done, it grieves you. Just don't go and take the bulldoze and look. Be wise, ask for wisdom. Remember, if anyone lack wisdom, let him ask God, and God will give liberally, said James, and he will not reproach us, but let him ask in faith. Pray for your people. Pray. And sometimes we do not use the scriptures as we should in praying, in wrestling with God. Prayer is a wrestling match. When you are wrestling, you grab your opponent. Your opponent grab you. And all your strength, your force, your vigor is to get him down, is to pin him down. Or he pins you down. He wins you lost. Until we are willing to wrestle like that. That's what prayer is. It's not lovely little terms we bring to God. No, it is wrestling, fighting. We wrestle in prayer. We wrestle with God. We plead with God. The Lord Jesus in the garden, he was wrestling. He was praying. He prayed so hard that he sweated blood. When he came back, we find them fast asleep. Peter, the Lord's heart was broke. Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? Peter, I'm only asking for one hour. Could you not watch with me one hour? Peter! In his state of vulnerability, all he needed was Peter. Peter was fast asleep. No wonder when he got up, he saw the army, drew his sword, and bang. No brethren. So, uh, wait a minute. What time do I finish here, sir? Twelve. Pardon? Twelve fifteen. So I have, okay, fifteen minutes, okay? That is the thorough reformation Josiah began at home. Now, Josiah went abroad. Let us see his reformation abroad. No, no. I, I won't be able to develop that. I, I better leave it. <laughs> won't you mind? And probably when we return, we might take it. We might take it. But let, us, let, let me conclude. Let me conclude because um, I didn't finish this morning. I don't want you to be left uh, a short change because you have paid for your thing and your church. You don't want to think, well, this crazy old preacher came and preached so long and so loud that I missed the juice. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. Brothers, my dear brothers, what I'm saying here to you, I don't apologize for the way I say it. No, that would be wrong to apologize. I mean, probably it's the manner sometimes I may say things. But when you feel things deeply, and when Let me say it again. When one feels deeply and to see the honor and glory
of the Lord Jesus stayed. His word is disregarded. And his people are not grounded in the truth. Knowing the brevity of life and the certainty of death. The reality of heaven and the reality of hell. It affects one deeply. Yet my brothers, don't be discouraged. Believe. Preach. And let us trust in the Lord with all our heart. Who knows what God may do for us. Let us press on. Forgetting the things that are behind, Paul says, I am pressing on to the things that are before. It's like in the Olympics. They are ready to go. They are pouncing. Their ears, their ears are upon, waiting for the gong, and their eyes are on the line. As soon as you hear the point, whoop, they go. But they are going for gold. Are we going for gold? Expending all our energy, mental, emotional, intellectual, physical, spiritual, for God for Christ, for heaven, so that men and women and boys and girls may not go to hell, but go to heaven. And preach, gentlemen, let us preach with passion, with sincerity, with warmth, with energy. And our God will hear us And he will do what is right. So do not be discouraged. For you young men, young boys, young men, some of you are just beginning. It's nice that you came. Some of you God may call to become pastors, preachers, or in your workplace. If God has not called you in your workplace, you are in your business. Be the best businessman. Be the best lawyer. Be the best doctor. Be the best accountant. Be the best of this. The best of that. Be the best. Do not be satisfied with mediocre. Be the best. Because in the best, you can glorify God. People will trust you. And who knows? Who knows what God may do? When people will come, they'll observe your thoroughness, your carefulness. You are putting into practice all the gifts that God has given to you. I'm going to do my best for God. Lord, give me grace. You at university, go for A's. Don't be satisfied with a C. Go for an A. You have A over here? What is an A for you? Pardon? Pardon? That's your highest mark? Okay. Go for a seven, not a six. You get that? Go for a seven, not a six. Oh, for you have a six is good. But go for a seven. That means study hard, work hard, because my life I'm going to give for God. This is what He has given me to God. I'm going to do my research well, because I want God to be glorified. Whatever you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, do it all for the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 And that's it, young man. Don't be satisfied with the mediocre. Don't be satisfied with a lower grade. Fine, if you get a lower grade, fine. But aim, aim high. Like Paul is running. He's running the race. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on. I'm pressing on for the prize of the high calling of God my Savior. He's pressing on. He's pressing on. Then he's arrested in Jerusalem. 
People say, well, Paul, we want you. Oh, no. A new ministry God gave to him altogether. He had to preach or speak to the high priest. And he caused panic in the court when he said, I am a Pharisee. I am the son of a Pharisee. For the hope of the resurrection, I am being tried today. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees clashed. To put Paul to death, they met. He stood before Felix, the governor. Felix wanted probably a bribe. And as he went to Felix, he was reasoning with him of temperance, self-control. Felix trembled and he said, go, go, go. I'll see you again. It was too hot for Felix. Phil could not bear this. <laughs> but that was all. And when he stood before King Agrippa, when Agrippa said, you almost persuaded me to be a Christian, sir. I wish to God you were not almost, but altogether. Then he dangled his chain, except for these chains. And on the boat to Rome, when he gave the centurion the advice, they didn't take it. And disaster struck, he kept quiet. Then he said, sir, you should have listened to me. However, take heart, eat, because my God has said, and in prison, he wrote letters to the churches. So I'm saying, in that sense, go for it. As Christian men, that as you grow, you become a strong Christian man, a strong husband, a strong father, a strong citizen, a good husband, a good father, a good citizen, a good member of your church. So when you invite people to church, they'll come and hear. Then you can say to them, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. And that is it. And for all of us, for those of us who are a little older, I would say, I say little older, not bigger older, but a little older. Let us press on. Remember Psalm 95. Dwelling in the house of the Lord. Why? That I will be fat and flourishing, full of greenness, full of chlorophyll, to show, to proclaim that the Lord is righteous, the Lord is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in Him. Our work is not over. And then we have something to contribute to tomorrow's generation. And those of you who are in your work, you are in your employment, oh, this is the gift God has given to you. Use it for His glory. Use it for the good of your own citizens. Use it for their well-being. Get them out of this. Get them out of that. Get them out of the other. At the end of the day, the Lord will say, Well done, faithful servant. You were faithful over little things. I'll make you Lord over many things. So, all our work, God has parceled out for us. Let us do it to His praise and to His glory. So, when we come, we will take the second, Josiah's Reformation abroad. And then we'll bring it to His conclusion. Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, we thank You for Your Word. Your Word is truth. It is true truth. And we thank you for it. We pray that you would enable us to understand it, to love it as men. That we may know it and embrace it and obey it and live it out wherever you have placed us. So that whether we are young or whether we are old, we may glorify you in everything. Thank you for your mercies. Thank you for your kindnesses. We pray. And return our thanks through Jesus Christ. Amen.